Psychology isn't just about asking, how does that make you feel? It's a science. As we mentioned in the last video, psychologists study behavior using research, not intuition or vibes. However, not all research is created equal. Some methods help psychologists observe and describe behavior. Others reveal patterns or relationships. But if you want to prove cause and effect, one method stands above the rest, the experimental method. In this video, we'll break down how experiments work and why they matter. So if you're ready, grab your notes, fire up those neurons, let's jump in. Imagine you've just invented a new pill claiming to reduce stress. You call it Anti-Stress 9000. Catchy, right? Now comes the tricky part. How do you actually test to see if it works? Should you ask a few friends to try and see what they think? Yeah, bro, I think I'm like 12% calmer. Take it yourself and notice if you feel less stressed. Or should you do something a little more controlled? To answer a question like this, your best bet is an experiment. Why? Because only experiments allow psychologists to draw cause and effect conclusions. Simply put, they let you see if one variable, in this case taking the pill, actually causes a change in another variable, like the person's stress level. As you move through AP psychology, watch out for key buzzwords in questions like cause, effect, or impact. Those are your clues that the experimental method is being used. And since experiments are kind of the VIPs of psychological research, and they'll keep popping up in every unit, it's worth breaking down the key parts of a solid experiment. First up, variables. A variable is anything that can vary or change in a study. For example, anti-stress 9000, the pill, is a variable because the amount given to participants can vary. 1 milligram, 5 milligrams, 10 milligrams, and so on. Stress is also a variable because it can increase or decrease as a result of taking the pill, from high stress to low stress. And there are two essential variables you need to know in AP psychology. The variable that the researcher changes or manipulates is called the independent variable. The variable that the researcher measures to see if it was affected, that's the dependent variable. Now why are they called that? The independent variable is called independent because it stands alone. The researcher controls it. The dependent variable is called dependent because it depends on what happens with the independent variable. Let's apply it to our example. You want to know if anti-stress 9000 affects stress levels. The independent variable is whether or not the participant takes anti-stress 9000 because that's what you're changing. The dependent variable is stress levels because that's what you're measuring to see if it changes as a result of taking the pill. And if you're still unsure, here's an AP Psych memory hack. Let's put it in a sentence. Stress levels are dependent on whether or not participants take anti-stress 9000. All right, let's go back to something from a previous video, operational definitions. Once your variables are set, you need to be specific about what they mean and how you're measuring them. You can't just say they'll feel less stress. That's too vague. So here's a good operational definition of the dependent variable. Stress will be measured by participants' heart rate and cortisol levels after completing a time math task. Boom. That's an operational definition. If someone else wanted to replicate your study, they could follow that definition step by step. All right, we've identified our variables and clearly defined them. Now what? How do you actually design an experiment to test the effectiveness of our magical anti-stress 9000 pill? We're going to need two groups of participants. One group will get the actual pill, anti-stress 9000. This is called the experimental group. The other group will either get no pill, or more commonly a fake pill, called the placebo, that looks real but has no active ingredient. This is called the control group, or comparison group. Why have two groups? Because we need something to compare the results to. If everyone got the real pill and stress levels dropped, how would we know if it was the pill that actually caused it? Maybe they just felt better because someone paid attention to them. Maybe it was just a good week. Or maybe they felt less stressed because they thought they were getting treatment, even if they weren't. This is known as the placebo effect. All right, here's a really important question. Who decides who gets the real pill and who gets the placebo? The answer is random assignment. Random assignment means that each participant has an equal chance of being placed in either the experimental group or control group. In other words, you don't assign them based on who seems more stressed. You let chance decide, like flipping a coin, or drawing straws, or consulting a magic eight ball. Random assignment is the unsung hero of experimental research. Random assignment helps make sure that two groups are as similar as possible at the start. That way, if one group ends up feeling less stressed, you could say, hey, it was probably the pill. 
and not just something like sleep habits or coffee intake. Let me say that again. Random assignment is huge. You're going to see this term again and again in research related questions throughout the AP psychology curriculum. If you ever get a question like, how do you know this study is an experiment? Or how can researchers control for variables that might mess with the results? The answer, say it with me, random assignments. Before we wrap up, there's one last research villain we need to talk about. Confounding variables, aka the gremlins of psychology research. A confounding variable is anything other than the independent variable that might affect the dependent variable. Basically a sneaky extra factor that can mess with your results. It's called confounding because it confounds or confuses the results. It makes it hard to tell what actually caused the outcome. In our anti-stress 9000 study, imagine if the experimental group took the pill in the morning after a full night of sleep. But the control group had to come in at 6 a.m. If stress levels are different, was it because of the pill or because one group was <sighs> exhausted? In this case, time of day acts as the confounding variable. So to control for confounding variables, psychologists use a bunch of strategies. One of the most powerful, blinding. In a single blind study, participants don't know whether they're getting the real treatment or the placebo. This helps prevent their expectations from influencing the results. Yes, our brains are that sneaky. But even researchers can unintentionally influence research by knowing who's in which group. That's called experimental bias. And to control for that, we use a double blind procedure. In a double blind procedure, neither the participant nor the researcher knows who's getting the real treatment. That way, expectations can accidentally influence the outcome. No winks, nudges, or totally not suspicious smiles. All right, AP Psych Brainiacs, let's lock in with a quick recap. We just walked through the key steps of how to design a psychology experiment, the go-to method for figuring out what actually causes what. All right, tattoo this on your psych brain. The experimental method is the only research method in psychology that can show cause and effect. Every solid experiment starts with two key variables. The independent variable is what you change and the dependent variable is what you measure. You need to know two groups, an experimental group that gets the treatment and a control group that doesn't, so you can make a meaningful comparison. Random assignment is essential. It helps reduce bias and make sure your groups start off as similar as possible. And even in a well-designed study, confounding variables can sneak up and mess with the results. So you've got to control for them. And finally, to avoid bias, especially expectations, use single blind or double blind procedures. So neither participants nor researchers influence the outcome. All right, thanks for watching scholars. Make sure to subscribe, hit that notification bell so you don't miss the next video. And as always, when in doubt, trust the data, not your gut.